Welcome to Living Answers for Today. I'm Pastor George Westlake from Kansas City, Pastor Emeritus of the Sheffield Family Life Center, and did a live Bible question and answer program for 24 years on television, and family and friends have asked me to do it again on YouTube now that I'm supposed to be retired. So I'll be here answering questions about the Word of God, and you can uh, you can send them in, and we'll try to take them in order. I have about four people here writing down the answer, uh, the questions that come in, and so I'll be glad to answer them live. Now, this is not a debate program. I will not debate with anybody. I will just express my own opinion of things. If you want to debate, there's plenty of plenty of places on email that you, uh, you can debate all over the country. And also, I ask that you do not quote anyone by name and ask us either to comment about that person personally or something he or she might have said, because I won't do it. That's the same way I did the radio program. It's always a privilege to answer questions about the Word of God. I'm never too busy to do that. I have people stop me in the mall with questions and say, will you answer a question for me? I'm always glad to talk about the Word of God. I have no apologies for believing the Word of God from cover to cover. God is able to give us a book to say exactly what he wants us to say. And he has done that, exactly what he wants us to hear. And so we need to be faithful students of the word of God and not try to read things into it, but to read as it instructs us. And I remind people that a, a, a word in the Bible means what it means in that sentence, in that paragraph, in that book. And it doesn't mean 50 or 60 other things. And so many people today like to, they actually like to lift things, lift things out of the paragraph where the Bible puts it. Again, it means what it means in that sentence, in that paragraph, in that book. And a, an example I use, suppose someone that doesn't know English comes to Kansas City and they say, I want, to, I want to go to the zoo and I want to see a big elephant. And I want to see a big elephant nose. And you say, no, no, on an elephant, it's not a nose in English, it's a trunk. You say, oh, okay, so it's a trunk on an elephant. And they're walking through the zoo and he hears some guy say, boy, I just bought a new car and it's the biggest trunk I've ever seen. The guy picks up his phone and says, I've got to call my wife. These Americans drive cars with big elephant noses on. Can't wait to see one. You see, the word elephant, uh, the word trunk meant what it meant in different contexts. Well, that's the way the Bible is. It means what it means in that sentence, in that paragraph, in that book. So we have questions already coming in. And I received one here. It says, my husband decided to join a religious group called the Black Hebrew Israelites. I don't know a lot about the organization, but he believes that going to a church is not of God, and we, are, and we need to follow the ways of the Israelites of the Old Testament. I've been a member of Sheffield Family Life Center for 26 years, and I have no plans to change my faith. This is so difficult, I can't think of a good question to ask biblically, how do I continue to be a godly wife and not follow my husband's faith? Well, number one, the faith is totally contrary to the Bible. Uh, the book of Galatians teaches that the Christians do not go back under the Old Testament law. And secondly, the whole concept of the thing is totally, totally contrary, not only to the Bible, but also to history. Now, the Bible says a woman should follow her husband's leadership as it is fit in the Lord. And the book of Hebrews says, stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and that much more as you see the day approaching. And I remind you that Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The letters of the New Testament are written to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in various locations. And so to believe this is to totally deny the whole New Testament, to totally deny that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins, which the prophecies of the Old Testament are all about. And the reason God picked out Israel was to give us a book to say what he wanted to say and to send his son through, uh, through, Israel, uh, sorry, through Israel physically. And so he did that when Jesus was born. He sent him Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and so on. And again, Jesus fulfilled 333 prophecies of the Old Testament. And it prophesies about that he would come. As Isaiah said, 700 years before his birth, he's wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. By his stripes, we have been healed. He also said 700 years before the birth of Christ, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And all this was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. 
So the whole system of this is to ignore the New Testament and to ignore the fact that Jesus Christ came and died for the whole human race. So you're to follow your husband's leadership as it is fit in the Lord, and that's a key phrase. And don't deny your faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll pray that your husband will receive and come to know Jesus Christ as his own personal savior. So Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. And the Bible says, he that has the Son has life, and he that doesn't have the Son does not have life. And so the whole answer, the whole way to God is Jesus Christ. The Bible's a book about Jesus. All the way from Genesis, where it says the seed of the woman's coming, is going to crush the head of the serpent, all the way to when Jesus comes back to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. The whole Bible is about him. And God has nothing to say that he doesn't say apart from his son. So hear what Jesus says in the New Testament. And again, love your husband, but tell him you cannot follow into that organization. Because God bless you. I hope God gives you strength and grace. Okay, do we have another question here? Okay, they're handing me these questions because I can't read that, that fast enough. How do you know that you have the whole armor of God? Well, you keep having to put it on. Everybody has the helmet of salvation when they get saved, but the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. There's that constant preparation of the gospel of peace. You never, you never reach the place where you know it all. You know, I've taught the whole Bible college level. I taught New Testament Greek for 25 years. I taught Hebrew for a couple of years, many years ago. I teach all over the world the Bible. But every time I open that book, there's something fresh. There's something new because it's a living book. So you never get your feet totally prepared for the, your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And faith is a growing process. Even the apostle Paul said, uh, said in one of his last two letters, the book of Philippians and 2 Timothy, I'm convinced were his last two letters. And what he says there, I have not yet apprehended that for which I was apprehended of Christ. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and stretching to the things that are before, I press toward the mark for the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And if you want to be perfect, be like-minded, being God's not finished with you yet. So you do your best to exercise faith. You do your best and ask God's help to have on the armor of God. And I remind you, as you read Ephesians chapter 6, part of the armor of God, after he mentions everything, uh, such as, I know, the girdle of, you know, the girdle of faithfulness around your waist, that he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. That's as much of the part of the armor of God of anything else. Something else that's interesting there in Ephesians 6, he uses plural you. Now, that's one nice thing about the Old English. It had a singular you, you, and a plural you, which is ye. And we don't have that in English. We just say you. But he said he actually said you collectively put on the armor of God. And the Bible makes it clear that we need other Christians to help us build our faith and to help us grow in faith. That's why the Bible encourages us to go to church in the book of Hebrews, to stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as a man of some is, and that much more as you see the day approaching. And after that, he warns against the practice of willful sin. He says if we keep practicing willful sin, that's we've received the personal, intimate re relation, relationship knowledge of the truth, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sin. So he warns against the practice of sin right after he encourages us to be faithful in going to church. Yes, you can serve God apart from church. You can watch it on television, but there's something about coming together. You know, Jesus said, he that believes in me out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. This spoke he of the spirit that they which believed in him would afterward receive, for Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Spirit was coming into the believers, and he says he will flow from the believers, meaning as a source. And when you get a whole bunch of believers together, so there is that much more power of the Holy Spirit and that much more power of the presence of God. And that's why we need to get together as the body of Christ and worship the Lord together. The illustration I use, you go up to northern Michigan and you see a little stream start to run down. You can block with your foot and go up to North Dakota and go up to Minnesota. But you check as those little streams run together and get down to New Orleans and there's the mighty Mississippi Delta because all these rivers has flown together. That's the way a church service, when you get together with the people of God and the blessing of God flowing through the congregation. So let me encourage you, if you don't have a church home, if you have a church home, be there every Sunday. 
If you don't have a church home, of course, we invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. We never try to draw people from other churches. If you're not attending church or you've dropped out of church, let me encourage you to come to Sheffield Family Life Center and you'll enjoy Pastor George's preaching as truly biblical, powerful, and very, very practical. And we have service at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock on Sunday, and I would recommend the 11 o'clock service if you come for the first time, okay? Talk about preterism. Well, my good friends that are preterists believe that all Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD with this destruction of Jerusalem. And they don't believe there's any more prophecy yet in the future. It all happened in 70 AD and was all summed up there at the destruction of Jerusalem. And I have a lot of good friends that are preterists. I just fully disagree with the interpretation. As a matter of fact, I was the only non-preterist speaker at one of their conferences many years ago. And I answered a bunch of questions, and they're very good, loving people. They're good brothers and sisters in Christ. I just told, I just wholly disagree with their position. Uh, the Bible is a book of prophecy. The book of Revelation calls itself a prophecy, and God's not finished with yet. The, the, uh, the plan of God is still continuing, and the Bible tells us how these things are going to end. And the, yes, in 70 AD was the destruction of Jerusalem, but Jesus said. In Luke 21, Jerusalem will be destroyed and they'll be scattered among all nations until the time of the Jerusalem shall be taught down to the Gentiles, till the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And that, 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 that there's going to be victory over that situation in the very future when Jesus comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I've recently written a new book on the book of Revelation. I don't have it published yet. Uh, many of you know that many years ago, well, it wasn't that long ago, I wrote I wrote the Global University textbook on, on Revelation and Daniel. And that textbook is used in over 80 countries of the world. Bible colleges has been translated into many languages. However, in that book, I had to examine all the various opinions and tell all the opinions of various people about the book of Revelation. So I've finally written a book now just the way I see Revelation after studying it for over 60 years and reading over 200 books on Bible prophecy. I know all the viewpoints, I know all the arguments, and my new book will be published as soon as I'm able to get it done. But I did finish it a couple of months ago. And if you want to know my age, if you're watching this program, I'm 87 years old. I started studying prophecy when I was in my 20s. And, and I do know all the various viewpoints. And that book will be, will be available. I will let you know where. How do you know you have possessed the promised land? Well, we don't possess the promised land. The promised land was for Israel. And when you receive Jesus Christ, the Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God, meaning that you know that you're saved. It says in Galatians, we know we have passed from death unto life because he has given us of his spirit. In other words, the spirit is the source of the witness that we receive. And we know that we know Jesus Christ. Now, if you're just religious, you don't know Jesus Christ. You can be religious without having a personal relationship with him. And that's why the Bible teaches Christianity is a relationship. Again, he that has the son has life, and he that doesn't have the son has left, does not have life. And Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And to prove it true, God raised him from the dead. And so if you don't know Jesus Christ, let me encourage you to open your heart to him. Ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, forgive your sin, receive him as your Lord and Savior, make a commitment of your life to him, and you will have the witness of the Spirit who will know that you've passed from death to life. Okay? Can you please explain Jesus only teaching versus the Trinity? Yes, the Jesus only tree teaching of the oneness teaching believes that Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, Jesus is the Holy Spirit, and there are three manifestations of the single person. Now, I know the Trinity, uh, the word Trinity is not used in the Bible, but, but the fact of the Trinity is there. And one of the interesting, one of the interesting things is John chapter 1. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God. And the thing about the original Greek language of the Bible, when it uses the, T-H-E, it is making a very positive distinction. And when it leaves the word the out, it's talking about character or nature. And John 1 literally says, in beginning was the word. Not the beginning, just in beginning. Uh, in beginning was the word, meaning anything that ever had the nature of a beginning, because the word the is not there, the word was already there. And it was... 
And it goes on to say, the word was with the God. And the fact that there are two these there mean two different positions. And then it says, God was the word. And it doesn't say the God was the word. It says God was the word. For Jesus to be the Father and the Son would have to say the God was the word. But it says God was the word, meaning the one called the word is identical in nature and character as the one called the God. And then we find out who they are when it gets to the 14th verse. It says the word became flesh and pitched his tent in our midst, and we saw his glory. The glory is of the unique one of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, many years ago on the radio program, someone asked me to explain the Trinity. And I was sitting there with my wife, Jean, and I said, said I can't even explain her, let alone explain the Trinity. I don't understand how God can exist as three persons, but I don't understand how God the Son could become a, a helpless baby laying in a stone feeding trough. I don't understand how God could put your sin and mine on his Son and punish him in our place. So because he, he, he has to judge sin, our sin was judged at Calvary. And when we receive Jesus Christ, his righteousness is down to account. That's the interesting thing. When you receive Jesus Christ, God opens a page to your book and he writes down righteous, not your righteous, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is given to you and put down to your account. There's no way we could ever be righteous to be righteous in the sight of God apart from what Jesus Christ does in our lives. So you know it because the Holy Spirit's there. Uh, and again, to try to comprehend the Trinity, uh, how God can create a time, create a billion times, a billion worlds speaking the world, I don't know. So we put faith in what the Word of God teaches, okay? Do you believe people that have gone on with the Lord and come back in spirit to visit family? Absolutely, unequivocally not. I believe God can give you a vision of that person. But there is no way that they can come back, okay? The Bible says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. God can give you visions. And I think that that happens many, many times. God gives you a vision of your loved one that stepped into eternity. I've never had a vision like that. I wouldn't mind it. I wouldn't mind seeing my wife again, but it would be a vision. It's not that she could come back and visit me. The Holy Spirit is the one that represents everything about God in our hearts and lives. And he can certainly give you visions if that's what God chooses to do. Okay. Why are some of the most famous prophecy teachers putting the Ezekiel war into Daniel 70 weeks? Okay, now... Uh, Daniel 70 weeks would take a whole lot to try to explain on this program. I am explaining it in detail in my new book on Revelation. And it's unfortunate that it, doesn't, uh, it actually says in the King James Bible, 70 weeks are determined. But the NIV translated accurately, 77s are determined. And what we're talking about is Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel is concerned about the captivity of Israel. And he's praying and seeking God, and God reminds him the captivity of Israel is for 70 years. Now, why is it for 70 years? He goes on to explain until the land enjoys its Sabbaths in Second Chronicles. And what the Mosaic law taught was every seventh year, the people of Israel had to let the land rest. They had not done that for 490 years or 70 times seven. And so the Bible says they will be taken out of the land for 70 years so the land can have its rest to fulfill the Sabbath they didn't let it have. And so that's where Daniel's thinking is. And the angel Gabriel says 77s are determined. In other words, there's another 490 years. And he lists six things that are going to happen there, which there's no way I could go into on this program. I have done that in the college classroom. I have done that in the church. And you may be able to find it on YouTube somewhere. So much of my stuff is on YouTube that I didn't put there. You may be able to find it there, but I'll let you know when my new book comes out and I make extensive study of the 77s of Daniel. Please explain Daniel's prophecy regarding the different countries involved in the end times. Well, we'll have to see what, uh, who the lion, the bear, and the leopard are. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, the last, uh, he actually talks about the last three nations in Western civilization uh, during the time of the Gentiles, and that takes a lot of explanation. He sees the lion, the bear, and the leopard in Daniel 7, and then in Revelation 13, where he's describing the future leader, the world leader called the Antichrist, and many other things. 
He also, he also indicates he has the characteristics of the lion, the bear, and the leopard. So people can debate about what the lion, the bear, and the leopard are. Maybe the United States, Great Britain, and, R and Russia. Maybe three other nations that he takes. And what it indicates that there will be a ten-nation confederacy. But the world leader will take control of three of them. And through three of them, he will take control of the ten. And I wouldn't debate anybody about who they are. I think we're just going to have to wait and see. I have my own opinion. And I may express, I haven't expressed that in my new book, but, but I do have my own opinion about that. So, so we actually can't, can't say who they are, uh, what countries they are. If a Christian developed dementia or Alzheimer, do you feel they still feel the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, they certainly can. Uh, my wife had Alzheimer's, and sometimes she didn't even know me. She'd say, who's George? And I said, who do you think I am? Abercrombie for Fufnif? Fufnif? That makes you Mrs. Fufnif. Or else I'd say, I'm, I'm Donald Duck, and that makes you Daisy. And she'd laugh. But she would pray for people, and they would get healed. The week before God took my wife home, they brought somebody to church that had, a lady had cervical cancer. She'd never been in the church before. They brought her down for my wife to pray for her. And even though my wife didn't know people, recognize the kids or anybody else most of the time, she prayed for that lady. The next day, the doctors couldn't find the cancer. And God took my wife home the next week. She would hit, sit here speaking to God. She had Alzheimer's, but she still had great faith and was in communication with God. Absolutely. God can communicate with people without us even being aware. I was actually beside a man one time who went into a coma. He went into the coma as a non-Christian. And when he woke up, I was beside his side. He'd been in a coma for several days. And he looked up in the verse and he said, Pastor, I met Jesus while I was in the coma. So God can deal with us even where we're not, other people can't see that God is dealing with our hearts and lives. Uh, does God care if you call him Jesus, Father, or Holy Spirit when you pray? No. Jesus said you can ask the Father in my name, but he also said whatever you ask me in my name, whatever you ask me, I will do. God the Father, God the Son. God is not as legalistic as people are. We like to come up with formulas. The Bible says, book of Hebrews, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. That means plain talking. Just come and tell God what's on your heart. I've heard, I've seen people be healed praying in the name of the Father. I've seen people be healed praying in Jesus' name. Of course, we always pray in Jesus' name because there's power in that name. The Bible says that Jesus is the name above every name, that before the Him, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the book of Philippians talks about though he continuously existed in the form of God, meaning all the angels seeing him before he became a human baby by his very form, they knew he was God. He laid aside that form and took upon himself the form of a man and was made in the likeness of man, being found in fashion as a man, meaning he became a 100% human and a 100% God. Okay, that's what Isaiah said. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, call his name Emmanuel, God with us. 100% God, 100% man. Okay, so he doesn't pray. It doesn't matter which we pray. And it says because he, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. So God is not a legalist. If you pray Jesus, pray to the Holy Spirit, or whatever you pray. Boy, here's a rather long one. My question is about the Olivet Discourse that provoked questions from the disciples concerning Jesus' statement that the temple would utterly be thrown down. Why does Matthew 24, 9 disagree with Luke 21, 27? After Luke gives a list of the signs, he then states before these things, the Jews will be persecuted. However, Matthew gives a list of signs and he talks about the persecution. But they're talking about two different times. If you go on to read Luke 21, he will explain that Jerusalem will be destroyed and Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles till the chime of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So he's actually been describing the last days for them further with what they asked about the wars, rumors of wars and all those various things. Then he goes on to say, but wait now, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles and you'll be led away among all nations till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. But when you get to Matthew chapter 24, he is talking about the last three and a half years of the great tribulation period. And so uh, why does he talk about there? Because Matthew's gospel is arranged topically. 
and he talked about the last three and a half years. Disciples asked Jesus three questions in Matthew 24. Number one, when will the temple be destroyed? Okay. Number two, what will be the sign of your parousia that you're coming? We call that the rapture and the end of the age. That's the battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes back as king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus did, or Matthew did not explain the destruction of the temple because this is the gospel to the Jews and he arranged much of it topically. So he deals first of all with the last three and a half years of the of the great tribulation that will climax in the day of the Lord when Jesus comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He deals with that first because Matthew is the gospel to the Jew and he wants to know how this is going to affect the Jews. Because in the middle of the tribulation, Israel as a people will finally recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah and they will come to know him. And that's what, Je that's what Matthew was talking about in his gospel. And and that's when he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, because that takes place in the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. And so he makes it very clear there that, the, again, there will be persecution. So you're talking about two different periods of persecution. If you go on and read Luke, you'll see it's the persecution before Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. If you read Matthew, it's the persecution after Israel received Jesus Christ as their Messiah, during the great last half of the Great Tribulation period, the day of the Lord, the Jet Future. Okay? And again, I'll explain that more detail in my book on Revelation. Uh, the night my mom and dad died, I felt someone holding my foot. I thought the Lord may have been letting me know everything would be okay. Do you think it could have been an angel? Absolutely. Absolutely. Angels appear to people. My wife used to see them all the time. I've never seen one. We've actually had people in church street see them. It was amazing when we first moved into our sit, into our church. Many of you know we're an inner city church. We have off-duty police officers outside every service, and we've stayed in the inner city. Uh, I've been there for 46 years. My son's been senior pastor the last 10 years, the last 12 years, actually. And we stayed in the city to reach the city with the gospel of Christ. And we moved into the new building across the street from our old building. We stayed in the same location. We still have our old building. That's our youth center. We stayed in the same location. We moved in 2001. Several people would walk out of the church from different parts and say, Pastor, did you see the three angels? And I'd, get, I'd come home and pout because I said, hey, I'm seeing your pastor. I ought to get to see the angels. And my wife would see angels all the time. I'd wake, I'd wake up in the night. She was carrying on a conversation, wide awake. And I never got to see one. So yes, God can give angels visitation. But our people would see three angels. And I never saw one. And... Uh, Actually, our music pastor, John Tillman, uh, he, was, he was at a music conference in Tennessee, and they were having an all-night an all prayer meeting. And in the middle of the night, the director came up to him, and he said, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're from, but God has told me to tell you he's assigned three angels to your church to protect the staff. We've never had any difficulty being an inner-city church. Never had any difficulty whatsoever, and we're at the middle of the city to try to reach people for Jesus Christ. Okay, I just handed another one. Pastor, I, I really struggle with the whole Job story. Why do you think God would have put him through the loss of his children to prove a point to the devil? I know he restored the material things, but the heartache of a child, I don't get it. You know, I'm glad I didn't have to go through it too. Uh, I think the purpose of the book is to show that the godly can suffer when they don't deserve it. And Job's three friends, of course, were accusing him of all kinds of things. And if you go on and read it, when it was all finished, God told his friends, unless Job prays for you, I'm not going to forgive you because you've accused my servant Job foolishly. Like a lot of Christians today, if someone is very sick and they say, well, you must have hidden sin. I know back in, back in the year, uh, in 1991, my wife had to have her stomach out with cancer, her whole stomach. And we got flowers from churches of all different denominations. We got about three letters, which of you has hidden sin? Well, after that, my wife traveled all over the world with me preaching the gospel. And the Lord took her home four and a half years ago. She got out of Alzheimer's just the last four or five years of her life. And, but you've always got people like that. And you know, there's not, another interesting thing I like about the book of Job. Job said, when I get a hold of God, he's going to give me an answer. And my friend Ira Stanfield that wrote Mansions Over the Hilltop also wrote a song, We'll Talk It Over in the By and By. And when he ministered at our church years ago, I asked him not to sing that. And Job, people say, well, when you get to God, he'll give you an answer. Well, Job said, when I get a hold of him, he's going to give me an answer. 
And you read the book of Job. One day he says, hey, you big windbag. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Answer me if you can. And he gave Job such a vision of his glory, Job forgot every question he ever heard. Said, I heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Do you think we're going to care what happened in 2019 when we stand in the presence of God and see his glory? Joyce with millions times millions that have gone on before. We're going to forget about what happened behind. We'll be rejoicing in the presence of God. Do you think it's possible to visit in heaven in our dreams? Not actually visit them. God can give you a dream. But I don't think you're going to be transported physically. I think that happened to the Apostle Paul, which he mentions in 2 Corinthians 12. I knew a man that was caught up to heaven, and, uh, and he saw things impossible to describe. But, but I don't think you're going to physically leave this body. I think that was just for special people to whom God wanted to give a revelation or had a very special thing to do. But God can certainly give you a vision. He's a God that provides visions, and some people have them. Is it wrong to belong to Masons? I personally could not belong. It doesn't matter what God you believe in. You can be a member of that. And uh, the Bible indicates that, we, that Jesus Christ is the way to God. And, and I personally could not join an organization that was supposed to be a religious organization and try to tell me I could go along with religions of other gods. I just simply could not do that. If you can do it, that's between you and God, okay? Do we have guardian angels? I've heard Bible teachers say they are messengers of God. Well, Jesus mentioned something about guardian angels for children. But I think I can look back many times and see when the angel of the Lord did for things for us. I mentioned in my Sunday school or my Wednesday night class, I teach every Wednesday night at Sheffield. And, and I mentioned to the class that uh, many years ago, there were five of us in a, a little six passenger Cessna on the way to Guyana, South America. And when we got there, the, the airport was socked in by fog and there were mounds around it, so we couldn't get in. And we were flying 50 feet over the ocean and it had an engine in the front an engine in the back and the front engine quit, just quit. And the man that owned the plane, he said, now we're going to have to look for some palm creams to set the plane down in because you notice the gas gauge is empty too. And uh, uh, the gas gauge for the back is empty too. And these aren't like your car gauges. These are accurate. That means that gap, back, back, back tank's empty. So we better pick out some good trees to land in. And so we picked out the trees and we got back out over the ocean. He said, we can, we can actually coast that far when the engine quits. We flew on that empty engine for a full two hours. And I'm convinced there had to be an angel behind going <laughs> either like that or going like this because the engine just kept running for two hours. Then when we finally were able to land, the second we touched ground, the engine quit. And it's amazing what God does. Uh, years ago, when you didn't have to fasten your seatbelt, I never did because I got rear-ended several years ago and the seatbelt shredded my rotor cuff and I just hadn't worn one since. And I came out of church one Sunday night and I just felt I should fasten my seatbelt. And I got down to 435, and I pull up at fast because I want to flow into the traffic. I don't pull up at slow. And I got to the top, and there was a car broken down right in the lane I was in, and an 18-wheeler right beside me. And I just screamed, Jesus, help me, hit the brakes. And I don't know how I did it. I missed the 18-wheeler. I missed the car, and I went down into a ditch. That had to be the angel of the Lord. And the very next day on the way home, the Lord spoke to me, said, the enemy is trying to destroy you, and I won't let him. And I'm driving an I-70, and a car in front of me started spinning around, and I was in the left lane. It was heading straight toward me, and all of a sudden, my car took, I, I stepped on the gas, but it, it was amazing. That car did not hit me, and it wasn't for me stepping on the gas. Had to be the angel of the Lord. Just absolutely had to be. Are we still to keep the Ten Commandments? Literally, if you read the New Testament, the whole Old Testament law was nailed to the cross. And uh, I like the illustration in the book of Colossians. Uh, he said, uh, he indicates that principalities and powers are against us, and they had a certificate of indebtedness against us. That's the Old Testament law. And it actually shows principalities and powers, demonic powers, waving the Ten Commandments in God's face and saying, you can't have George Wesley. He's broken all ten of these. 
You know, it's interesting. Some people say, well, I don't go to church, but I keep the Ten Commandments, but you just broke the ninth one. You've lied again. If you've ever told a little, a little itsy bitsy lie, you've broken the Ten Commandments. And like the book of Galatians says, to be saved by law, you have to keep it perfectly. You can't break one little part of it. If you ever put yourself ahead of God, you're a lawbreaker. If you put anybody ahead of God, you are a lawbreaker or anything. But, they, but they're waving this saying, George Wesley's broken all 10 of these commandments. You can't let him into your presence. And Colossians says he took this certificate of indebtedness and he nailed it to his cross. And the King James he says he spoiled principalities and powers. You know what that means? It means he came down and took ahead of me and carried me off the spoil. Okay, is this coming off on the program here? No. Okay. Okay, he carried me off as spoil. So that's what that's what he does. The whole book of Galatians. Uh, if you read the book of Galatians, Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey and established churches at Icona. Uh, they established churches at Lystra, Derby, and, I, uh, and Iconia, okay? And immediately the Judaizers came in. So now that you're saved, you got to keep the Old Testament sacrifices and the rituals. Uh, you have to keep the feast days. You have to keep the Ten Commandments. And Paul gives seven distinct arguments to show in the book of Galatians that when you receive Jesus Christ, you are no longer under those commandments. Now, technically, Jesus nailed the ten to his cross. Nine of them are repeated in the New Testament for Christians. The only one is not repeated is keeping the Sabbath day. And that's the only one that's not repeated for the Christians in the New Testament. But technically, we're not saved by keeping any law. And people are always trying to bring it back under the law. The first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews are written to show the Jewish Christians that they're not under the Old Testament law or the ordinance or, or anything like that. And the book of Galatians is very, very strong in that. I have a chapter in my book, The Most Often Asked Questions on Sunday Night Live, that's available from Sheffield Family Life Center. And they're $10, and all the purchase of those goes to missions. I don't take any money from that at all now. And all the money goes into our missions program. And it's the most often asked questions for the 28, uh, of the 24 years I did this on television. But we are not under the Old Testament law, but the principles are still the same. You don't murder, you honor your parents. But again, the only one that's not repeated in the New Testament is keeping the Sabbath day. Uh, do you think the chips available now that's placed in the hand, hand or arm is the mark of the beast? I think the mark of the beast will definitely be a chip uh, because it talks about something put in the skin. It could be a mark that's on the skin plus a chip that's on the inside. And I had a friend many years ago before we knew anything about that. Uh, he was in the, uh, he was in the business, the electronics business, that kind of thing. And he told me many, many years ago, he said, George, I've got a chip now that will go through a, a uh, it'll go through a hypodermic needle and it can have your whole life history on it and everything about you. And I think that's definitely what's gonna happen. I don't have to think you have to be afraid of a chip, but I will never receive one. I don't recommend taking one, but it'll be a particular chip. It'll be connected with the worship of the Antichrist. I had a sister call me on the radio program before we did television years ago. And she said, I got a check that's got 666 on it. I'm afraid to cash it. I said, send it to me. And then I wanted to assure her, no, go ahead and cash it because 666 will only mean something during the tribulation period. And if you read, if you read Revelation 13, it's connected with the worship of the, the world leader who's called the Antichrist. And uh, he's called the mystery of iniquity, called the lawless one. He's called the prince that shall come. He's called the king of fierce countenance. We know him as the Antichrist most of all. He's called the beast in the book of Revelation. And uh, it will be connected with his worship. And so it's not wrong 666 or anything of the kind. Okay. Talk about the existence of modern day apostles, prophets, and their roles. I think a modern day apostle, I would describe as a missionary. Uh, you read the apostles that they went into places, they established churches and they oversaw the churches. The apostle Paul established churches all over the Roman empire and they were the leaders of the church. I think some people claim the title, the word means one sent with a commission. If someone wants to call himself an apostle, I'm not gonna argue with them. I, I've preached in churches where the pastor calls himself an apostle. And I always respect the church I'm preaching in. And, uh, but uh, uh, a lot of prophets 
there's a lot of prophets around that are claiming to be prophets that are not prophets at all. I think if you're a prophet, you don't have to walk around saying, I'm a prophet, I'm a prophet, I'm a prophet. And a lot of, there's a lot of self-proclaimed prophets around in this day. God can use people for prophecy. God can lay it on the heart to have a prophetical message. I remember David Wilkerson, who wrote The Cross and the Switchblade. He absolutely had a prophetical ministry. And yet sometimes he would come out with things that were not, 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 not prophetical and not accurate. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, you're supposed to, you're supposed to check the prophets and make sure what they're saying is absolutely biblical. And so, yes, God does have prophets today. But again, I think people that go around and establish churches and oversee them would fulfill the, of the apostolic ministry. Okay. When it comes to reading, studying the Bible, what version do you recommend? I would recommend the New American Standard as the best, uh, the most accurate translation from the Greek text. Now, I'll still use a little bit of the Old English, but it's the most accurate translation of the Greek text. Are all Bibles true? No. Uh, you've asked me uh, about the New World Translation of the Bible for which no scholar will take the blame. And it's full of what actually came to be called Gnosticism uh, after the period of time. When Alexander the Great conquered Western civilization about 300 years before the birth of Christ, he carried the Greek language with him. And that way, of course, when Jesus Christ was born, everyone spoke what I call street Greek. And the New Testament is written in street Greek. I heard a radio preacher say years ago, we know the Bible's the word of God because of such high caliber Greek. No, it's not street Greek. It's the way people on the street spoke it. God wanted everybody to understand it. He wanted it to be plain to the average person. And the closest thing you have to classical Greek is the book of Hebrews. But it's, it's absolutely street Greek. And uh, so, but he also carried, uh, he also carried what's called Platonic philosophy, the philosophy of Plato. Because he was a, a, a man by the name of Aristotle, who you've heard of, was a student of Plato. And Aristotle was a teacher of young Alexander the Great. So he carried Western civilization. When he conquered Western civilization, uh, he actually carried the Greek language and also Platonic philosophy. Well, Platonic philosophy separated spirit from body. And there's, uh, it was an early attack in, in early Christianity. It popped up right away and later became strong about the third and fourth century. But it taught that God is holy, one, one form of it. I can't deal with all the forms of it. A one form of taught that God is holy and anything material is evil. Therefore, a holy God could not have created this evil universe. So God created a lesser God who in turn created everything else. Well, the Bible makes it clear that Jesus created everything that's been created and uh, that he is equal with God, that he himself is not a created being. And the book of Colossians teaches that. It says, for by him, uh, he is the firstborn of every created thing. Now, don't misunderstand firstborn. Jacob made Joseph his 11th son, his firstborn, okay? He named them his firstborn. The word has to do with preeminent. Israel is called the firstborn nation. It wasn't the first nation on the earth. It was God's preeminent nation. And so, and so Jesus is the firstborn of every created thing. Why? For by him were the all things created. Now, a man by the name of... Uh, of Homer wrote the poetry, the Odyssey, and the Iliad several hundred years before the birth of Jesus. Okay, several hundred years before Alexander the Great. And he coined a phrase in Greek, ta panta, that means the all things, that means everything that exists. And so Paul picks up on that phrase in Colossians because he's writing against that particular heresy. He goes on to say, for by him were the all things created that are in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, invisible, but they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. The all things, top panta, were created by him and for him. He is before the all things, and in him the all things hold together. And it goes on to say, God did that, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now, the New World Translation of the Bible says he created all other things. But the word other is not in any Greek text whatsoever. That was added by the translators. He created all other things, okay? And the Bible makes it very clear. The Bible says in John chapter 1 that all things came into existence through him, and apart from him there came into existence not one thing which has come into existence. And so he is God the Son, 
God has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There was never a time when there was not God the Son. So the New World Translation says that. And by the way, the Mormon Bible is not a Bible. It's the Book of Mormon, which is totally, utterly, completely different than the Bible. It does quote the King James Bible in many places, but it's totally, totally, totally not the Bible. Okay. Why do I hear people say that Jesus' real name is Shu? Is Yeshua, if this is correct. Yes, yes, in Hebrew, it's Yeshua, which we translate as Joshua. But, but they try to say you've got to pray in the name of Yeshua. But I remind you, we get the name of Jesus from the Greek New Testament, and in the New Testament, it's Yesus. And so uh, it doesn't, because we don't speak Hebrew. Yeah, in Hebrew, they say Yeshua, because that's what it is in Hebrew. You go to Latin America, they say Yesus, uh, or Jesus. You go to you go to Indonesia, they say Jesus. We say Jesus in English. We all talking about the same person. And it's interesting, you can go to Indonesia in the name of Jesus, the demons leave and people are healed. You can go to Latin America, the name of Jesus, people are healed and demons leave. You can go to Israel and pray in the name of Yeshua and the demons leave and people are healed. And here we pray in the name of Jesus because we're speaking English. And if you go to Greece, it's Jesus. And so it's the same person we're talking about. And some people try to get legalism. Oh, you have to use the word yes, Yeshua. No, you don't. No, you don't. And it's actually the same word we translated Joshua. Very common name in Israel. Very common name. Jesus came to be common, okay? Came to be a, a human, human being. That's why he was born in a baby and laid in a stone feeding trough, all right? Why do they think so many churches have gotten so lax on salvation calls or altar calls? I think people can be saved sitting in their seats. Now, I personally always give an altar call. I know Pastor George will give them sometimes, and sometimes you'll have people pray in their seats. And I, at funerals, have people pray in their seats, a sinner's prayer. And a young man that used to be our, uh, he was our youth pastor for many years. He's now pastoring his own church in St. Louis. And his uh, his daughter is now married to, to, uh, to our pastor, who, who is our pastor of young adults. And he was at his grandfather's funeral. He, uh, uh, he was 18. His girlfriend was 16. They were both high on drugs and alcohol. And I had them pray the sinner's prayer. The whole congregation prayed at his grandfather's funeral. God revolutionized their lives. So people can be saved either way, but they have to be given the opportunity either to pray that prayer to come publicly. I prefer to have people come publicly myself. I never heard an auto call. I was 19 years old. And I, even though I attended church and I didn't know I could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I recited the Apostles' Creed. I sang the doxology. I prayed the Lord's Prayer. But I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Until that night, when I went to a, to a church and I heard an altar call and I responded to it, and they led me in a prayer. And Jesus Christ changed my life. It was interesting. I, I went to church with my mother. I saw my mother cry for two years when my dad walked out on us when I was a teenager. And then one night she quit crying. I found out later she'd asked Jesus Christ to come into her heart, be Lord of her life. She was always a good woman, always went to church. Her family always went to church, but never knew we could have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, so she, started, she started going to this little basement assembly of God church down at the end of our street in Detroit. And I was going to another church, and she kept trying to get me to go to her church. And I said, I've got my own church. I was 19 years old. I had a fairly decent job working in the office building at General Motors. And uh, uh, and I get home from church one Sunday, and she's on the phone. So my friends have been praying, you're going to church with me tonight. I said, I'm not going to church with you. I've got a date. I had a date with a beautiful little dancer that I loved. And uh, about an hour later, the girl called and broke the date. So I told my brother, well, mother, well, I'll go to your crummy church if you promise never to ask me again. She said, okay. Well, that night the pastor was giving the altar call. Who wants to know Jesus personally? My hand started to tingle. Pulled him apart, put him back together, started to tingle. So I raised my hand. The man next to me said, if you want to go down and pray, I'll go with you. That's why we do that at, at our church. We still do that because that's how I met the Lord. And they started to lead me in a sinner's prayer. They said, son, ask God to forgive me for his sins. Well, my thought went through my mind, why should I do that? I haven't stolen any more than the rest of the guys. Why should I ask God to forgive me for my sins? Now, the second time, I know it was the Holy Spirit. I prayed the sinner's prayer. 
And then the, the pastor said, I want the young man to give a testimony. I said, what's that? He said, what's God done for you? I said, I don't know, but something happened. Well, it did. I was 19 years old. He revolutionized my life. I got drafted a year later in the U.S. Army. I started preaching in Korea. And, and, and that was during the Korean War. And when I got out, I went to Bible college because God had called me to preach. And so it, uh, uh, it's amazing the way God, but I always give an altar call. So, Please address race in the church. Well, racism has no place in the church. If you're familiar with Sheffield Family Life Center, I'm going to make a statement. The white supremacists don't like us, and the black supremacists don't like us. Sheffield is the largest truly multicultural church in mid-America. Now, when I came here 40, it would be 46 years ago next month, uh, uh, the first Sunday of March 1973, it was an all-white church of 200 and we had less than 200 adults, and we had some bus children coming in, but, but it was an all-white church of 200 adults. And I hadn't been here very long till I started screaming at God, the kingdom's not white. Please give us a church that represents the kingdom. The Bible says God made of one blood all nations. And honestly, I as a young man, when I was drafted in the United States Army, I did not know racism existed. Uh, uh, my parents were from Canada. My mother was born in England. They moved to Detroit three months before I was born. My dad was a warehouse foreman in Detroit. We had brothers of other, of other race in our home. Uh, when I was growing up, we didn't think anything of it. As a matter of fact, when anyone would start an ethnic joke in our house, my mother would say, shut up. You don't talk like that in this house. And, and I would just talk that everybody was the same. And when I went in the army, I got sent to Augusta, Georgia. And it was a whole thing enlightening to me. You're talking about 19, um, 1952. And I was sent to Augusta, Georgia. And I was shocked when I got on the back of a bus and I saw all the brothers and sisters sitting in the back of the bus. I'd go back there and say, can I please sit down with you? And they said, yes, go ahead. I had a black friend I wanted to take to church. And he said, you ask the pastor if I'm cut. He said, I can't go to your church. I said, what do you mean you can't go to my church? And that would be thought of in Detroit. Of course they could come. Anybody could come. And then they he said, I can't go to your church. So I asked the pastor. He said, they have their own churches. If I hadn't been in uniform, I'd have punched him in the nose. But I'd have probably been court-martialed. But, but I asked God to give us a church of representative the kingdom. And he's done that. The Bible says in the book of James, you can't have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with respect to persons. And, and actually, the Greek word translated respect to persons means literally the taking of faces. And you can't, have, you, you can't have prejudice against another person and be a Christian, according to the book of James. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? God made, God made of one blood all nations. I don't understand prejudice. I just simply cannot comprehend it. And because there's so much love in our church, you get, you get into our church, it's a large church, but people say they feel the love of a small church. And we don't care where you come from, we're not, a, we're not a social club, we're a hospital for hurting people. We don't care about your background. And everyone is welcome there. And we want you to feel the way. Our staff is multicultural. Every part of our church is multicultural. That's the way heaven's gonna be. And I didn't know how to do that, but God did it. And uh, uh, he's done that, and I appreciate it. But if you've got respect to persons for someone because they don't have your education, or someone of a less economic level, or someone of a different race or a different culture, and you have respect to persons because of that, then you better pray and get the victory over it. Okay. What about the Message Bible? The Message is not a word for word. It's not a translation. It's a paraphrase. And it's actually a paraphrase of the author. He puts it in his own words. Now, it's good teaching, but it's not the same as studying the Bible when you read the message. He, he says, uh, he puts a lot of things, a lot of things, good ways. And I like the message, but not as a study Bible. A study Bible, you need to have a word for word translation. And even things like the New International Translation and the New Living Translations are what we call dynamic equivalent. And the, and the people that translated it look at the, looked at the Greek or Hebrew language and then put in their own words what it meant. And it's not a paraphrase, but yet they're putting it in their own words. And for a serious study Bible, you need a word-for-word -word translation such as the New King James 
are actually uh, the uh, New American Standard. Okay. Uh, the New King James and the New American Standard Version, aren't they both about as good? Yes, that's what I just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, the New King James and New American Standard. Do you think the church has got off track with the prosperity teaching? Absolutely, unequivocally. Uh, it's, uh, the Bible doesn't have one gospel for America and another gospel for my brothers and sisters in Togo, West Africa, who the only way they can survive is go out in the jungle and, and get things in barter. And uh, and I go to I go to Myanmar and teach. I've gone there eight different times. The average pastor there made fifteen dollars a month up back years ago when I first started going. Lord bless me to enable me to take some American hundred dollars and give them away to the pastors. But this idea of the prosperity teaching there's something wrong with your faith. The book of James says the poor are rich in faith. What are you going to do with that scripture? The poor are rich in faith. And then when you read over what Paul tells Timothy, okay, what Paul tells Timothy, uh, I want to read from 1 Timothy chapter 6. Okay, I have my Bible in my hand here. And I use the Westlake James Version. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? I'm reading the King James, but I've taught the Greek New Testament. I know what the Greek says. And any place that needs different, I, I read that. But we read this, and he's talking about false teaching of the last days. And then he goes on to say, uh, uh, I read verse 5. He talks about different things, perverse disputings of men and of corrupt minds and does do the truth. Now, supposing that gain is godliness. In other words, how much stuff you have shows how spiritual you are. And if you're spiritual, you're going to have a lot of stuff. Well, that must mean the Hollywood crowd is really spiritual, okay? Now, he goes on to say, from such withdraw yourself. Godliness with contentment is great gain. In other words, real value is godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world that's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing, let us therewith be content. They that will to be rich, those that are exercising their will to be rich, fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue after righteousness and godliness, faith, love, endurance, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. And Paul flatly warns against that type of teaching. Now they take the phrase uh, from John's writings, I want you to prosper as your soul prospers. But what is prosperity? Prosperity has nothing to do with money. Uh, they would say shalom, a shalom with your family, a shalom with you. They meant well-being, relationships, and all kinds of those kind of things uh, when they would meet each other. And in the New Testament, it was grace. is grace with you, charis with you. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's good to have nice things, and most of us would rather have more than less. But Jesus taught in Luke 16, if we're true with our finances, he will give us the true riches. So true riches have nothing whatsoever to do with money. And I've never had money in the bank. I've never had a lot of money in the bank. But like I tell people, and I mentioned it uh, last night, at the, I had the privilege of speaking at the, uh, in the men's unit of the City Union Mission last night. And I asked him, you want to see a prosperous man? I showed him a front view, a side view, and a back view. So you're looking at a prosperous man. I've never had much money. But God is, God gave me a wife, I can tell honestly, every day for almost 60 years. I love you forever. He gave me three magnificent daughters, a beautiful son, and a great son. He gave me three spectacular son-in-laws and a beautiful daughter-in-law. He's given me now 14 grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. And I get to carry this gospel and see lives changed all over the world. To me, that's prosperity. It's got nothing to do with money at all. Okay? Some teach once saved, always saved. What if a person believes they're saved but really are not? Does God hold that preacher responsible for misleading people? No, I think the brothers that believe that, they have integrity. 
Uh, we all see through a glass darkly. Uh, we all have disagreements. When I preach in a church where I know the pastor believes in what I call unconditional eternal security, I don't deal with the issue. I go to preach anywhere I'm asked to preach because I, I'd rather preach than eat. I tell pastors, if you don't want me to preach, don't invite me. And uh, because I love to preach, but I preach frequently in churches where they believe that, but I don't believe that. Now, the main emphasis of the Bible, he's able to keep you. Jesus said, my father gave you the mighty nod. No man can pluck you out of my father's hand. Well, we have a brother in our church. We call him Big Al. He is one of the strongest men I have ever met in my life. And the illustration I use is Big Al had a little bug in his hand said, no man in this church can pluck this out of my hand. Nobody's going to argue with him, but that doesn't stop the little bug from flying away. Now, we still have a free will. And I, you know, Paul says, I know whom I believe. He's able to keep my deposit against that day. Jude says, unto him that's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the throne of his glory to the only wise God, our Savior, be poor power and power and glory forever, now and forever. Amen. God's able to keep us. But there are warnings in the scripture. Jesus in the parable of the, the uh, I know the seed and the sower showed that some of the seed grows for a while. And the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke it out and it dies. The book of Colossians says he will present us holy and unnitpickable in his sight if we continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The book of Hebrews says how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The word means to drift away from it. Hebrews goes on to call them holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling. Beware lest there be in any of you, my brothers, an evil heart of unbelief and apostatizing from the living God. In other words, going to the place where you no longer believe Jesus is the way of salvation. Hebrews chapter 10 gives a warning. Peter, in his second letter, talks about if you depart after you've received the knowledge of the truth. Now, in the original New Testament, but I don't like to use a lot of Greek unless I explain the words. The basic word for knowing is gnosis, okay, gnosis. But there is experimental knowledge called epinosis. And the difference I say is two plus two is four, that's gnosis. But one, two plus one, two equals one, two, three, four. That's experimental knowledge. That's epinosis. That word is only used of true believers in the New Testament. Now, the, the author's the translators don't make any distinction between them. The only distinction made, as I know of, is in the NIV, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, now we have knowledge and we will have full knowledge. But it's even more than that. It's experimental knowledge. You see it, you experience it. And Peter indicates that after someone has epinosis, if they go back to their own life, they're like the dog going back to his vomit, and the sow that was washed was walling in the fire, in the mire, and it's better for them not to have known the way of the truth. Now, it's not just talking about someone that hears. He uses epinosis. I know one author said, well, these are in the Bible in case this can happen. Doesn't that make God foolish to put things in the Bible that can't happen? And others like to say, well, they weren't really Christians. The Bible teaches like they're Christians, calling them holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling. The New Testament is written to Christians. Again, the emphasis is God's willing to keep you. But I remind you, the prodigal son started out at home. When he went into the muck and mire of the pig pen, he came back home. The father said, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. But again, the main message is God's able to keep you, but you still have a free will. He doesn't make a robot out of you. Feelings about the lost book of Thomas. It is not a lost book. It's an apocryphal book. The word apocryphal means hidden. It is not a true gospel. It comes from the fourth century. And Thomas wasn't around in the fourth century. We have so many of these books that picked up Bible names that were not written by them, such as the book of Enoch. We don't have any literature from Enoch's time before the flood. The oldest book we have is the book of Job. That's the oldest book known to the human race today. And we don't have anything from before the flood. But we have all kinds of apocryphal books written down uh, using biblical names, and the, and the book of Thomas is actually an apocryphal book, not true, not scripture. Someone called me on the TV program years ago and said, what about the lost books of the Bible? I said, God doesn't lose things. He has in the Bible exactly what he wants there. Job's children were in heaven, not lost. 
You got right. He gained the same amount of children to fulfill the double blessing. Is this correct? Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Okay, that was an easy one there. Okay, we got all kinds of questions. I love answering questions. Mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. Uh, we don't know what it is. I think it's a microchip uh, because the, uh, you have three things in Revelation 13. You have the mark or the name or the number. Now, we know the number is 666. Okay, we know the number is 666. We believe the mark is something put in or on the skin, which would be a microchip. And also, I believe it's going to be something on the skin, but the microchip. And uh, we don't know the name. Okay, we don't know his name. Okay. Have a friend say he thought we were in Revelation chapter 6. Do you think the church is gone at Revelation 4? Yes, the church is gone beginning of Revelation 4. Uh, you can't find the word church anywhere else in the book of Revelation after chapter 4. And let me give you the outline Jesus gave himself for the book of Revelation in chapter 1. He told John, write the things which you have seen. All John had seen to that time was the vision of Jesus in chapter 1. Write the things which are, that's the letters to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And write the things which must take place after these things. After what things? After the things that are, were, you've seen, and after the things that are. And he's, and the third point of the outline, write the things that will be after these things. Let me give you a Greek phrase, mata tauta, after these things. After the letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, chapter 4, 1 starts out, mata tauta, after these things. I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And that first voice which I had heard, that was the voice that said, I'm Alpha and Omega back earlier, was speaking to me, say, come up here, and I'll show you the things that must take place, mata tauta, after these things. So 4-1 opens with mata tauta, ends with mata tauta. You cannot find the church anywhere in the book of Revelation until the story is over, and then he gives a warning to the church to be ready for his coming. The church is in heaven in chapter 5. You've redeemed them by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. Made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. And they see the Lamb of God opening the seven-sealed book. And when he opens the first seal in Revelation 6-1, that's when the man of sin makes his appearance. And it takes a lot of detail. He uh, he's the false Christ, the imitation Christ. The word anti means instead of. He is the instead of Christ. He comes on the scene. He's wearing a diadem. Uh, he's wearing the victor's crown. The Greek word is Stephanos. We get our English name Stephen from. That's the victor's crown. When Jesus comes in Revelation 19, he's wearing the diadems, okay, the kingly crowns. But this man has the victor's crown, and he has a bow. Well, he has a bow in his hand, not the rainbow, the bow and arrow type bow. When Jesus comes back, the only weapon mentioned the two, is the two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth. He just has to speak the word and it's all over. So this is the imitation Christ that comes on the scene. You cannot find the church anywhere in the rest of the book of Revelation until the story's over. Now, there's many other scriptures I could mention, but it would, I'd be here all night and all day tomorrow talking about the scriptures. But... Uh, the promise to the church at Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, because you've kept the word of my endurance, I will keep you out of that hour of testing, which will come to test all them that dwell on the face of the earth. He said, I'm going to keep you out of the hour. He doesn't say I'm going to keep you from the difficulty. Hour is a time measurement. I'm keeping you out of that hour. Okay, so he's keeping you out of the time. He tells the church at Thyatira, those that have this doctrine of idolatry, I'm throwing into great tribulation, but the rest hold fast till I come. And so the church will not be here during the great tribulation that begins in Revelation 6.1. And uh, I could go into a whole lot more detail, the promise to the church at Philadelphia I've already mentioned. But if you read what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, describing that time, he gives the order of events. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Now, if, uh, if you read Revelation 12 and Daniel 12, the same event, Michael the archangel comes on the scene to fight for Israel and the trumpet of God. Now, there are seven trumpets blown in the book of Revelation, but they are angelic trumpets. You have to go back to the book of Isaiah 
where he talks about the trumpet sounding to reassemble Israel. And if you read, if you read the book of Hebrews, it tells us that the first trumpet sounded at Mount Sinai. The last trumpet is going to sound to reassemble Israel. And the illustration I use is that in the Old Testament, Israel is God's exhibit A on earth. Today, the church is exhibit A and Israel is exhibit B. When the church is gone, Israel will again be exhibit A. The trumpet of God is not one of the seven angels sounding. Those are the seven trumpets announcing the opening of the seven sealed book. And so Paul describing that, he goes on to say, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another in these words. But the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need that are run you, for the day of the Lord, that's the tribulation, will come as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a wolf's child, and they shall not escape. And I'm not going to quote the rest of it. But Paul gives the outline, the rapture of the church, the church being caught out of here, the day of the Lord beginning. Now, when you get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there were some of them thought that the persecution they were enduring was the day of the Lord, the great tribulation period. And so uh, someone even sent them a letter and signed Paul's name and said, this is the day of the Lord. Well, from what Paul had taught them, this meant to them they missed the catching away, the parousia, the rapture. They missed that event. And so Paul goes on to say, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the coming, and he uses the Greek word parousia, when used by itself, refers to the rapture of the Lord, and by our gathering together unto him, that you stop being shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, by a letter supposedly from us, that the day of the Lord is here. Now, the King James misses it, says the day of Christ. Every other translation says the day of the Lord, which is accurate from the Greek. That day, the day of the Lord will not come till the man of sin be revealed. So he's telling him the fact that you don't see the Antichrist, the man of sin, means you have not missed the catching away. The man of sin makes his appearance in Revelation chapter 4. Now one author, uh, he tried to say they couldn't believe that it was the tribulation because this, uh, the, 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 all the things in the book of Revelation weren't happening. Well, the book of Revelation hadn't been written yet. The first and second Thessalonians were Paul's first two letters, and Revelation wasn't written until about 96 AD. And so but they didn't know those things. And even in this day when some people have been enduring tribulation, knowing the book of Revelation, some of them have thought they were in the great tribulation. But no, the church will be caught, the church will always endure persecution. But this is the time called the cup of God's wrath. And Paul goes on to say to the Thessalonians, God has not appointed us to wrath to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's just briefly. I have a whole chapter on that in my new book. Okay. Okay. How can I know what my spiritual gift is? It's very difficult. Uh, if you feel to move in a, God will direct us by providing opportunity. And it's very difficult sometimes to know what our spiritual gift is. Every Christian's gifted. Every Christian is gifted somewhere. Paul teaches that in the book of, in the book of Ephesians. Every Christian is gifted. And uh, so, so God has a gift for you to operate in. And the Bible says God works in us to want to and do his good pleasure. So if God, if you feel strongly that you want to do something, it's possibly God trying to draw you to that spiritual gift that he's given you. When I first got saved, when I was 19, I wanted to preach so badly, just right away. And I have a speech defect. I stutter except when I preach. And I, and I have several times tonight. I try to talk and nothing comes out. And the night the Lord called me to preach when I was 19, I said, God, I can't talk. God promised me when I preached behind the pulpit, I would never do that. Never one time in 60 years have I done it. Teaching, I do it. But, but when I'm preaching behind the pulpit in a church, I've never done it once in over 60 years of preaching. God promised me that night I wouldn't. And so, but, but I asked my pastor, I said, doesn't everyone want to preach? He said, no. But then I read what God says. He works in us to want to and do of his good pleasure. So I tell people, if you feel you would like to work with the youth in church, try it and see. Uh, if I felt I'd like to work with the babies, I know I'd run out screaming, pulling my hair out at the end of an hour. So that's, that's not my gift. And so you try it and see, is this, is this where I fit? Now, as far as the manifestations of the, of the Spirit are concerned, they're mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 
God will provide opportunity for you to use that gift. And the first time is very difficult, but you just have to take that step of faith, feeling that God is directing you and he will not interrupt. Okay, I'll have to look that up. James 5, 13 to 16. I'll have to look that one up. I can, uh, you know, one thing James says, I tell people James is from Missouri. Uh, he basically says, you claim you're a Christian, show me. Okay, now, uh, okay, five, let me. James 5, 13. Okay, James 5, 13. Is any among you sick? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now, the elders of the pastors. Okay, let them pray over him, anointing him with the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if they have committed sins, he'll be forgiven him. Now, that's a promise. We do that. We pray for the sick. We pray for the, for, uh, for the sick in our services. And God heals some, and he doesn't always heal. Now, it's amazing. People ask me, huh, why, why doesn't God heal some? Why doesn't he heal others? If he doesn't heal people, it doesn't mean it's lack of faith. My wife had more faith than anybody I met. I lived with her almost 60 years. I can honestly say I never saw her do anything I would call sin deliberately. She was saved when she was five, filled with the Holy Spirit when she was seven, knew she could be a pastor's wife when she was 10. And yet she had all that sickness the last five years of her life. And I, I mentioned in 1991, she had to have her whole stomach out with cancer. We, we don't know any reason for that. And Paul said, uh, he had a thorn in the flesh. Now, the King James translation is weak there. It's actually the sharp stake that they used to wait off their enemies. They put around the palace. It's not a rose thorn. Okay, that's a whole different word. And it's a sharp stake, more like a tent stake, but it was a war stake. That when you, Paul said, I had a stake in the flesh. And he called it an osthenia. Osthenia is translated sick all the way through the New Testament. And he said, I besought the Lord three times that it might depart. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made complete in your weakness. And you never know how God can use your sickness. When my wife had her stomach out, her Chinese physician received Jesus Christ as a result of my wife being in the hospital. And some of her nurses accepted the Lord when she was there. She was in ICU five weeks. And I told you after that, she traveled all over the world with me. And I know other people that have been saved through the sickness of other people. And so God doesn't always heal. Now, I expect every time I pray for someone to get healed, but they don't because we don't heal. God does the healing. And it's not lack of faith. God may have a reason for allowing you to go through the test. And what if you would have prayed for, for Job in the middle of his test? God wouldn't have healed him. He wouldn't have been healed till the test was over. What does the fruit of righteousness mean? Well, the, uh, the context there is if you live a righteous life, you're going to see fruit in other people. Of course, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Self-control is the last one mentioned. Love is mentioned first. So the fruit of righteousness... You live a righteous life, God will bless you, and you'll see fruit of that. It might be people. It might be things. It might be a whole lot of different things. It might be a certain kind of peace that you have. To me, the fruit of righteousness, living for God, is the fact that I get to do things like this, answer people's questions or share the word of God. To me, the fruit of righteousness is family. And uh, but, but you see what God does because you're faithful in serving God. Then got my son-in-law Kevin's here handling me all this stuff. I'd have never got this thing together. It wasn't for my grandfather, my grandson Gio. He was, he was actually in Minneapolis, and my son-in-law Kevin here who worked overtime getting it together. Doesn't it seem the weather over the earth is changing, uh, is changing due to prophecy? It might be. It might be. Or it might just be cycles the earth goes through. I've often wondered. I know during the millennium, of course, that's after the tribulation, there's going to be the whole topography of the earth is good. The whole atmosphere of the earth is going to be changed. So uh, 
it said the sun will increase its light. And it's all going to be changed. So maybe God's starting to do that now, getting ready for it. I don't know. But, but there are changes taking place. But again, it might be that the earth goes through cycles. Okay. Are there any two told today on the paradise side of the grave? Possibly those who have never heard of his salvation message. Uh, no, I think the souls in the paradise side uh, were empty. Uh, those who have never heard, God has to deal with them. And, uh, you, you know, you wonder about that. The book of Romans talks about the, uh, what the uh, what the philosophers call the moral law. Uh, uh, the Jewish, uh, Jewish rabbis call it the law connected with Noah, the six principles that all people all over the world seem to know. And Romans chapter one indicates people could have a revelation of God in creation and they've disobeyed it because he's trying to show all are guilty there. Chapter two, he talks about the conscience that God has placed within us. Uh, but I, uh, as, as far as I read the Bible, the paradise side is empty. Once Jesus emptied it because paradise is in heaven now. Paul said, I, for those of you that wondered about the question, it's the, it's the Greek word Hades and the Hebrew word Sheol. In the Old Testament, when people died, they were gathered to the heart of the earth. One side was torment, one side was paradise. Jesus told the thief on the cross today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Uh, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, meaning he was a guest of honor at a feast in paradise while the rich man was in torment. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, I knew a man who caught up to paradise. So paradise had been moved, okay? So if anyone dies today, if they're righteous enough to go to the paradise side, they'll actually go to heaven. If God forgives and forgets, why does he judge us with the book of righteousness at the gates? I don't read anywhere where he judges us at the book of righteousness at the gates. I think that's a figment of religion. And uh, the Bible talks about it, the great white throne judgment. But if you read the book of Revelation chapter 19, that's after the thousand year reign of peace, and the great white throne judgment is there for the ungodly. The sins of the Christian were judged on the cross of Calvary. And there is no, uh, there is no uh, book of judgment. There's no book of righteousness at the gates. Okay, that's not taught in scripture at all. There's nowhere in scripture that says that. That's a, that's a, that's a religious tradition that someone's come up with. Excuse me. The scripture says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, and explain the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, I answered this last week, but just to mention it again, my wife has gone home to be with the Lord. She's in the presence of God. Jesus died for the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. Okay, her body is in the ground out there, you know, off banister, okay? She's in heaven, the presence of the Lord. Uh, and what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those that sleep in Jesus. Now, the Bible doesn't teach soul sleep. That was the idiom in the Gentile world for death. We might say they've passed away. They've gone to be with the Lord. They expired. Paul is writing to a Gentile church, the Thessalonians. So he uses their terminology. Them that sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? So what he's going to explain now is that my wife, Jean, is with the Lord. But when Jesus comes back at what we call the rapture of the church, that that body will be resurrected and join her spirit, soul spirit, because Jesus died for the whole person. Now, let me quote it for you the way it says, them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain at the parousia, the coming of the Lord, will not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So he died for the whole person. Well, that's what he's talking about. Now also, in the 1600s, a man by the name of Peter Giroux started to say the rapture will be a secret thing. Nobody will know about it. And the whole Left Behind series on, and the movies just showed Christians disappearing. This guy is going to be one of the noisiest, loudest, best-known events in the history of the world. And the noisy thing when millions of people are missing and bodies are raised from the dead, it's going to be a colossal, noisy event. And we're going to be caught up suddenly? You know, I get on a roller coaster and go, woo! 
Imagine what it's going to be when suddenly we're caught up and changed by the power of God. And, and I believe that's why so many people will be saved during the tribulation period. And because there will be people saved according to uh, the book of Revelation chapter 7. It says literally these are those continuously coming out of the great, out of the tribulation. Okay. You have to be baptized in order to take communion. It's got nothing to do with communion. Communion is the Lord's table. And uh, Jesus invites everybody to his table. I think the communion service has been badly misused from what Jesus intended it to be. He said, this do in remembrance of me. And a lot of people quote first, uh, I think it was first Corinthians chapter 11. If you committed a sin, you better not commit it. But if you read first Corinthians chapter 11, basically what Paul says is he starts talking about the church, the believers being the body of Christ in chapter 10, about verse 40. And from there to the end of chapter 14, the theme of first Corinthians is we are the body of Christ. And he talks about a lot of different things. But then he talks about the communion service. And before he says, I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, and so on. He actually starts talking about they can't have communion when they come together. Why? Because of what they had was what we'd call it a potluck dinner. They called it a love feast. And they would get together. And Paul indicates that the wealthy people are getting food and the poor people are doing without and then they tack the Lord's Supper on the end of it. And he goes on to indicate, you despise the poor. You're despising the church of God. You're shaming those that don't have. Then he goes on to talk about the Lord's Supper and says, you can't take the Lord's Supper properly if you're not discerning the Lord's body, if you're not taking care of each other. And when he's all finished, he says, therefore, when you come together, tarry one for another. Make sure everybody has food. There is no cleansing power in the communion service. Jesus invites you to his table to feast with him, to fellowship with him. Jack, uh, oh boy, what was his name? The pastor, the great pastor in the great four square church in, uh, in Los Angeles for many, many years, Jack Hayford, Jack Hayford. He preached a sermon many years ago, said, celebrate the table of the Lord. I remind you the communion service took the place of the Passover. When they say this is the this is the flesh of the Passover lamb. Why? We were delivered from Egypt, a time of celebration, a time of joy, and to come to the Lord's table is a time of saying, God invites us to his table to celebrate what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. Um, I got a phone call years ago. We were on, we were on, we were on TV. And a man said, if I come to your church and you're taking communion, I can't take it, can I? I said, of course you can. He said, what if I'm not a member? I said, you don't have to be a member. It's the Lord's table. What if I'm not saved? I said, who would Jesus not invite to his table? And um, we always, when I always had communion, I would preach about it. And I would give an altar call like I always do for people to come and receive Jesus Christ. And then it was time for the communion. And I would tell people, if you have never come to the Lord's table before, if you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, as you eat this bread, remember his body was broken for you. As you drink this cup, remember his blood was shed for you. And for the first time, as you eat this bread, receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And I've already given an altar call. People have come and been saved. After the communion service, I'd say, how many received Jesus Christ for the first time in your life, taking that communion and hands go up all over the church, all over the church. It's the table of the Lord. Who do you think he would turn away? Read 1 Corinthians 11 very carefully and be sure and read what comes before and what comes after. And where he says, not discerning the Lord's body, he's not talking about the body on the cross. When he's talking about the body on the cross, he'll say the body and blood. When he's talking, just saying the Lord's body, the context is you and me. And the issue is, how are you treating your brothers and sisters in Christ? And then when he goes on to say, because of this, many are sick and many have died. I agree with and what I heard David Lim say years ago, uh, he was the president of Asia Pacific Seminary, then pastored the huge Grace Assembly uh, in Singapore that had to have two campuses. And he made the statement, the reason they're all sick is because the body's not taking care of each other. And I absolutely believe that. And uh, so I have a lot of help with these questions here tonight. I have my son-in-law, Kevin, have my daughter, Linda, over here. And I have Rocky and Dana Candelo here who are very good friends. And they have a tremendous ministry going on. 
And uh, he just, I know God blesses them tremendously and they're good friends. I've known Rocky since he was a teenager. That means we're all getting really old, okay? <laughs> we're all getting really old, okay? <laughs> That's it. Got more? That's it. That all the questions? Oh, it's already 7 o'clock? Well, I could do this all night. I could do this all night. I enjoy answering questions so much about the Word of God. Thank you for watching. And uh, we'll be back uh, next week. We'll be back on Sunday night, probably, instead of Saturday night. But I know the Super Bowl is going to be tomorrow night, and our audience might be slim. So I thank you for watching the program tonight. I trust it was a real blessing to you. We had some other things come in before, and I'll have to save those till next week. God bless you. If you're not going to church, find a good Bible-believing church. There's no reason anywhere in Kansas City not to be part of a good Bible-believing church. And again, if you don't have a church home, we'd be delighted to see you at Sheffield Family Life Center. And you can look at the website, fslc.net. Okay, FSLC, standing for Sheffield. Okay, FSLC. Okay. No, I said that wrong. SFLC. That's right. Yeah, SFLC. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. Well, it won't let me do it. Well, we're trying to get off, folks. It's not letting me do it. I'll just go up here and click it.